Okay, so you guys got your tests back. Um, I want you to work on those, do corrections. Again, you have a few weeks to do corrections on those if you'd like to. Um, if you have any questions on them, we'll answer some next week. I'd like to have at least the weekend to look them over and see if you can figure them out on your own. So unit four is going to be geometry and statistics. Um, we only spend a few days on statistics, but statistics, I think, is one of our more important topics. Um, we only spend a few days on it because this class is designed to prep you for other courses. And we don't have, I mean, we have a business math course that some of you would go on to that has a little two-week section on statistics. So that few days is more than adequate to prepare you for that. But we also do have a full statistics course that's up every semester. I think is one of the most valuable courses you can have in your as business. I mean, look in most businesses, about 90% of your managers are have a background in statistics. The two biggest things for uh, CEOs and CFOs and, and major corporations, the background in statistics and accounting are the two biggest um, traits that they share. So it's something that I think is very really important. If you have any extra time, we'll use it on some of the statistics. So anyway, we lost. Of the, the weather shut down. So hopefully we can catch up here in the next couple of days. We want to start out our geometry talking about measurement. Measurement is has become a complex concept, but it started out with a very simple need. It was a need to communicate. You know, if two people are trying to build identical things. If they're in the same room, it's easy to do. They can just walk over to where the other one's working and mark it off to make sure they've got things the same size and so on. But if one is down the street or across town, or maybe they want to save it for later so that they know, you know they can build another one exactly like it later, they need a way to communicate those sizes. So they might take a piece of paper like this and they might measure it with, Let's say I have a pen. So they might take this, I might take my pen and say it's one, about two pens long is that piece of paper. Well, I might send you a message saying, hey, that's two pens long. So you might go, okay, here's my pen, there's one, there's two. Well, your two pens long would only go to here. So the, what you're going to cut is going to be much smaller than what I had. Even though you still measured correctly, the pen you had was smaller. So measurement, to, to, to communicate that accurately, required two things. One, is that both people had one of those objects, and two, that the objects that they both had were approximately the same size, or at least pretty close to the same size, actually. So for length measurement, we're going to start out talking about standard measurement. The old customary measurement, if you want to call it that. And standard length measurement, what they used was parts of the body. The inch is our shortest unit that we typically use in standard measurement for length. An inch was defined to be the, le the length from the end of a person's thumb to the point of that first knuckle. That was an inch. So I can take my piece of paper and go one, two, three, four, and I can measure it out like that. Now, yes, there are people with bigger or smaller hands, but there are two things to say. Um, back then, first of all, the average height of people were shorter. It was much shorter. It was like five foot three, five foot four for a male. So the variation between the size of their hands was much, much less variation. Second, it was defined to be a man's thumb, just because those were at that time typically the people working in the trades. And so again, you didn't have the, the variation between genders to deal with. Bigger than an inch was the actual unit of length they had for, for the standard system. Yep, a foot. There you go. How many inches are in a foot? Twelve. A foot is, as you would think, the length from the end of your longest toe to the back of your heel. Um, now, most feet now are quite considerably larger than 12 feet in a, or 12 inches in an adult. But back then, again, people were smaller. And there wasn't 
12 of their thumbs in their foot. Um, it was adjusted much later. In fact, in the 500s, King Edward declared that his thumb and his foot and his everything else were going to be the official measuring units of the land. So they came in and they took, you know, measurements of his thumb. They cut little blocks of wood or whatever and passed them out for people to use. Same with his foot and the other, other measurements. And even though that was a very egotistic act, that was quite a huge advancement in measurement because that allowed us then to, to, to get rid of some things. First of all, that foot. If I wanted to measure the height of this wall here, you know, these inches would be feet. Inches would just be, it'd be too small. Taking my thumb and going up there would be, it would take a long time to do it. But if I'm trying to measure it in feet, I could get up to maybe about here with some serious stretching. But I'm not getting my foot all the way up to the plane. So a foot was really only good for measuring things near the ground because that's where feet are. For measuring things that were taller like that, we had a unit called the hand. The hand was the width of the hand where the fingers connect to the palm. So right across there. That was about four inches. And actually it was adjusted to be four inches. And that's what was used for measuring vertical heights, like the height of a wall. Um, some things still just have kept that as a tradition, like livestock, sheep, horses, cattle. Their, their height is still measured in hands. We don't need that unit anymore, though, because of what King Edward did. Once King Edward declared his foot in his hand, once we started cutting those little blocks to measure with, I didn't have to get my foot to the top of the wall anymore. I could get my measuring stick my one foot measuring stick and go up the wall. So some of those other units like the hand were not necessary anymore. Bigger than a foot we have the yard. The yard contains how many feet? Three feet. Now a lot of people think of the yard as the length of a person's stride and that is approximately a yard but that's not where it came from. Um, the yard To the end of the yard. You ever seen a measure fabric? You can see they'll grab it on, they'll pull it out one yard, two yards. That's what a yard was. And of course, King Edward declared that his yard was the official yard. Now, again, there were not three of his feet in his yard. It was a couple hundred years later that they decided to adjust those units so they did work. Up until that point, if you measured something in inches and I measured something, something else in feet, there was no way to compare to see which one was longer. There was no conversion between them. One of us was going to have to go back and remeasure in the other unit. So by adjusting them to, to make it so there was a conversion between them, allowed them to compare between units. Now, bigger than a yard, there were other units that are now extinct. Um, one was a, a fathom. A fathom was about six feet. It was actually a navigational unit. A fathom was the shallowest water that most of your large trading vessels could navigate through without hitting bottom. So they measured, literally, they would take one of the tallest soldier or tallest sailors and throw him overboard. And if his head was still out of the water, it was too shallow to navigate. Hopefully they pulled him back in, but who knows? It was different. Um, a unit that's bigger than a yard that is lesser known that we are going to mention here, a rod. One rod is 5.5, five and a half yards, or 16.5, 16 and a half feet. The rod was originally a shepherd's tool. Um, they have the two things, the rod and the staff. The staff is that hook, kind of like little Bo Peep has, and that was for hooking the animals around the neck so you could shear the wool, tend any wounds, um, things like that. The rod was a defensive weapon. It was literally a sapling tree that they would cut down, debranch it, and they would use it for fighting off wild animals that threatened the flock. Um, 16 and a half feet is a pretty long stick, but you think about it, if you're you know, fighting off a wolf with nothing but a stick, you kind of want that separation. How did it become used for a measuring device? Well, let's say that you and I both have sheep, and those sheep go down in the valley to graze, and at the end of the day, I say, well, I had 12 sheep, and you say, well, I had 15 sheep, but there's only 20 sheep down there. Well, one or both of us is lying, or exaggerating at least, how many sheep we had. 
And of course, fights broke out. With cattle and horses, they solved this by branding. Well, sheep branding didn't work quite so well for a couple of reasons. The wool grew out pretty thick to where you couldn't see the brand anyway. Um, cattle and horses were shorter haired, so you could see the brand without having to search too hard. Second, and I don't know why I find this one so funny, um, wool is kind of flammable. I'm picturing the sheep running across the prairie in a ball of flames. So the way it was solved is they'd find a landmark, like a big rock or whatever. And we would mark it out and say, okay, you're going to pasture your sheep over here. I'll pasture mine over here. And to make sure that they're the same size, I would take my rod, I'd lay it on the ground. Then you take yours and lay it on the ground end to end. I'd take mine and bring it and lay it. And we'd count one, two, three. Okay, this is 80 yards wide and 120 yards long. We have the same pasture land. So that was really the beginning of dividing up land and getting land ownership. Was, you know, sheep, sheep herding. To this day, if you look at an official survey of, of land, they are done in rods or chains. Um, a chain, I believe it is 66 feet for a chain. I haven't used that one for a while. Bigger than rods, there are units like furlongs and others that have, well, chains and furlongs that have disappeared that we don't use anymore. Um, Cubit. The cubit was the distance from the, the point of your longest finger to the tip of your elbow, or tip of your longest finger to the point of your elbow, however you want to do it. Um, a cubit was approximately 16 inches. It was used for construction. Um, think about it in construction, everything is 16 inches. The spacing of floor joists, the spacing of wall studs, spacing of roof rafters before they switch to trusses. You wouldn't want to take your foot and hold it up there, and you wouldn't want to take your thumb and count out 16 inches. It was just, that was your arm. So the length of your arm was your spacing for everything. That's why every house was slightly different because the, the person building it had slightly different sized arms. But yes, that's where that spacing come from. Is they would just use their arm to space things out and that was a cubit. Um, the furlong is an eighth of a mile. Um, that was literally the distance a horse could run at full speed without being winded before it'd have to rest. Sounds like an eighth of a mile doesn't sound like very far, but think about it. You, I can't run. I couldn't run an eighth of a mile at full speed without having to rest. So, a mile. Anybody remember how many feet are in a mile? 5,280 feet or 1,760 yards. Um, there are several stories about where the mile came from. One being the distance King Edward could see from his throne out the window. Um, the most credible um, example, the example I've seen is uh, the Roman and Greek military. It was the distance, a pace was considered starting on your left foot, going to your right foot, and then back to your left foot. So it was the distance of, of Roman and Greek soldiers marching a thousand paces in formation. That was a mile, it was a thousand paces. Which makes sense. One pace being about 5.28 feet, a thousand of them would be 5,280 feet. And again, those have all been adjusted through the years. Let's look at some other units then in the standard measuring system. We want to look at capacity versus volume. A lot of people use these but there is a slight difference. Volume is found by lengths. And generally it's defined to be a box. Volume is a calculated distance. Or a calculated size, I should say. If this were 20 inches by eight inches by 10 inches. The volume will be 20 inches times eight inches times 10 inches. Or, 
Now what does that come out to be? 1,600 inches cubed. So volume is calculated from lengths. I mean, they really do measure the same thing because both of them are measuring how much can be held within an object or within something, but they're just approaching it from different directions. In capacity, we're going to start out with the larger, one of our larger units and work our way down. We're going to start with a gallon. A gallon was the size of an average man's hat. Now, I'm not talking about a cowboy hat. I'm talking about your dress hat, like your little derby style hats. That held approximately one gallon. Um, you heard a cowboy hat called the 10 gallon hat. Well, it's not because they could hold 10 gallons. It was a fantastic term. Um, when people started wearing the cowboy hats, which were worn even probably, I guess, just for mostly for sun protection and wind protection, um, people would be sarcastic. Oh, that's 10 gallons. The sarcastic comment. Smaller than a gallon or nothing. A quart. How many quarts do you have? Four, yes. The word quart actually comes from quarter gallon. So four of them in a gallon makes sense. Smaller than a quart? Pint. How many pints do you quart? There's actually two. Two pints in a quart. A pint was a standard size jar. It was used for serving well, serving alcohol and for storing canning, uh, a pint. Again, the size of the pint in the quart was adjusted slightly. The, the pint in the gallon, I should say, was adjusted slightly to make them fit together. Um, a gallon was actually made larger to accommodate the pint fitting in. Um, the gallon, the quart, and the pint were all considered wet measure or liquid measure. They were for measuring liquids, usually, fluids. Smaller than a pint, you had a cup. How many cups in a pint? Two. Cup was dry measure. It was for measuring flour, sugar, other parts of cooking. It literally came from your cupped hand. Whatever you could put, you know, heaping in your cupped hand was a cup. So that's where that came from. Sm What's that? If you're cooking, a that's the process. That's not where it came from, but yeah, that can be used for measuring a tablespoon. Um, smaller than a cup. We have fluid ounces. Anybody remember how many fluid ounces are in a cup? Eight. Perfect. Smaller than a fluid ounce, approximately eight pounds, depending on the fluid. If it's water, it's eight pounds. One fluid ounce contains how many tablespoons? Anybody know how many tablespoons are in a cup? There's 16 tablespoons in a cup. So there's two tablespoons in a fluid ounce. Two times eight gives you the 16. Smaller than a tablespoon is a teaspoon. Anybody know how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon? Three. A note on abbreviations here. Tablespoon can be abbreviated with a capital TBSP like I did. Or it can be a small TBSP, or it can be just a capital T. Teaspoon can be a small TSP or just a small T. Note there is, and in fact, tablespoon could actually be a capital TSP as well. So you can see there's a lot of similarities in those abbreviations. The most common one that's used now is the capital T and the small T. So you have to be very careful. Capital T is tablespoon, small T is teaspoon. It's easy to mix those up. Now, these next ones I'm going to put up here just for fun. I'm never going to quiz you on them. But there is smaller than a teaspoon. One teaspoon contains two dashes. 
a dash was basically a spice shaker, kind of like your salt shakers, but it's bigger. And you take a dash of just dipping it once before it comes out. One dash contains three pinches. Yeah, a pinch was you stick your fingers together, pin it with a die measure. Whatever stuck between your fingers was a pinch. Something like that, yeah. Well, it was a sixth of a teaspoon. One pinch contained two smidgens. This one, for some reason, always grossed me out. As you stick your finger into flour or sugar, whatever sticks to your finger, you put in there. Which I can't help but thinking the cook with sweaty fingers had bigger smidgens. It just always it sounded, it just grossed me out. They actually do, if you go to a, a baking shop, you can actually buy measuring spoons for those. Again, you won't be tested. Other units that are in there, bigger than a gallon, we have a peck. Anybody, or, you know, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers? A peck is two gallons. If you ever go to a strawberry patch and buy berries, they usually have those cardboard or wooden trays those are one pack and two pack trays a bushel is eight gallons or four packs anybody know how big a barrel is 55 gallons is a drum it's actually 31.5 gallons Quarter barrel of seven and seven eighths gallons. Every good college student should know that, right? So that is our utility for capacity. Next, I want to talk about how first I should do the crossover between capacity and volume. Our volume was cubic inches or cubic feet, units of length. Well, one gallon contains, and I shouldn't put equals, I should put approximately equals, 231 cubic inches. They were never intended to work together, but since they developed, they decided they better figure out what they were equal to. It is, to measure in cubic inches? Well, yeah, yeah. But if you have a, you know, a box, you know, a plastic box or whatever, or a waterproof box, Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at cubic feet, you've all seen a five gallon bucket. Do you think a five gallon bucket is bigger or smaller than a cubic foot? Or about the same size? It seems like it should be. One cubic foot is actually, technically, you usually say 1.48, but we're going to just round it to 1.5 gallons. So actually, a, a five-gallon bucket is only two-thirds of a cubic foot. It's because it's rounded. Let's look at the next thing that we need to look at this calculation on is weight and mass. Now, if I back to their volume, I define the difference there, but it's not a real important difference because they really both measure the same thing. The difference between weight and mass is much more important. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. By matter, I mean the amount of particles, the amount of atoms. If you really want to get specific. It is how much material is within that object. Weight is the force of gravity on an object, which again, the more mass it has, the more weight it has too, but the biggest difference is how, difference is how they are measured. Weight is a measure of force, and force is usually measured against a spring. You take a spring and you stretch it, 
the amount it stretches depends very precisely on the amount of force. If you stretch it two inches, if you double the force, it's four inches. It's very linear that way. So they use a scale for measuring weight. And you also have a string. And then you have an indicator on that string. With a marked off set of markings. So the, the distance that indicator moves is the weight of that object. You put that object on there and it stretches out. Well, the distance that indicator moves is how far the string stretches. That's the weight. Mass is measured with something called a balance. Looks kind of like a very precise little teeter totter. But the object we're trying to measure on one side, and on the other side, we put known masses until it balances. Once it balances, whatever the known mass is, that's also the mass of the object we're measuring. Now you might think, why is that a big deal? Well, because weight depends on gravity. If we go to the moon, where gravity is one-sixth what it is on Earth, going to pull less of that object and the string is going to pull much less. So the weight will be much less. Well, you might think, well, gravity is going to pull less on the balance as well. That's true. It's going to pull less on our object, but it's also going to pull less on our known mass. So the known mass will still balance it. So the mass doesn't change when gravity change, changes. The weight does. The weight depends on gravity. Now, on Earth, gravity is relatively constant. There is actually a slightly less than a 10% difference between the equator and the North Pole. At the North Pole, and technically the South Pole as well, is where gravity is the strongest. And at the equator, it's the weakest. Um, somebody who weighs about 200 pounds at the North Pole would weigh about 188 pounds, 190 pounds. There is a chance you can measure the difference, but it's relatively close. So we tend to kind of blur the lines between weight and mass. And in fact, they really blur the lines when we start talking about metric measurement. More about that as well. There is a standard unit of mass in the standard system. It is called a slug. This is probably the last time you'll ever hear the unit of slug being used for measuring because in the standard system, we tend to ignore mass and focus on weight. But you heard the phrase, there's a whole slug of them over there. That's where it came from. So a slug weighs about 32 pounds. So it's a decent amount. So let's look at weight. And let's start out again with our big unit, which is a ton. A ton is the how big? 2,000 pounds. Now, 2,000 pounds is actually going to be a net. Or short ton. 99.9999% of the time you hear the word ton, they're talking about the net. In this class, whenever you hear the word ton, we're talking about 2,000 pounds. But there is something called a gross or a long ton. That is 2,240 pounds. Is it? Okay. Only when they're buying. When they're selling, they probably use. Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize that. Um, sure. Okay. Um, the reason there's, there's two of them is the ton was originally used for buying and selling grain, and you can't put a ton of grain on a scale and have it have it stay there. Um, so the container that held the ton of grain was about 240 pounds. So think of your paycheck, gross pay. You work 40, 40 hours at $12 an hour. You've earned 480 bucks, but you don't get that much. They take out taxes and stuff. That's your net pay. Same here. Gross was the grain with the container. Net was just the grain, how much you actually got for grain. Smaller than a pound. Well, first of all, the abbreviation for pound was LP. It would have made sense to use PD for pound. But in the bookkeeping system for buying and selling grain, PD was already used as the abbreviation for paid. Didn't want to confuse them. 
but they use the Latin word for pound, which is libra. So LB comes from that. Smaller than a pound we have? Ounces, how many ounces are in a pound? 16. The abbreviation for ounce is OZ, which comes from the Latin word for ounce, which I can't remember right now. I've looked it up a couple times, but right now I can't recall, but it doesn't matter. It still comes from that Latin word for ounce. Smaller than an ounce, we do have drams. Drams sound metric, because gram is metric, but a dram is a standard unit. There are 16 drams in an ounce. A gram is a little more than 1.5 gram. Smaller than a dram, we had minims. One ounce is approximately 60 minims. The dram and the minims were your apothecary units for medications. You might be prescribed a quarter of a dram of a medication or you might be prescribed three minims or 10 minims of a medication. Then there is also something called grains. Grains did not go from ounces, they went off of pounds. There were 7,000 grains in a pound, and this is the like grains of sand. Um, take your tweezers and count out 7,000 grains of sand should be approximately a pound. Yeah, not real pleasant. But. There was also medications, you know, like 100 grains, they'd have to, the pharmacist would have to sit there and count out a hundred little grains of that. They did develop little measuring, yeah, little cups, little measuring tools for that. Now, a little bit of a side note, you're not gonna be tested on this, but I feel like I should mention it. You might hear on the news all the time, you know, gold has reached $2,000 an ounce or whatever. When you're talking about precious metals, you're not using these units. You know, we talked about King Edward declaring his thumb and his foot to be the official measurements in the land. He was not the only ruler to do that. Other rulers around the world did the same thing. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, the foot was not the same length from one country to the next or one region to the next. So these other units had the same type of deal. They were standardized differently from one region to the next. So, yeah, our foot may be considerably different from an imperial foot or whatever. Precious metals, the same thing happened with, of course, the, the pounds and ounces. Precious metals, the, the center in the world for trading precious metals for a long, long time was the island of Troy in the Mediterranean Sea. And on the island of Troy, they used Troy measurement. One Troy pound is only approximately 0.82 of our regular pounds, of our standard pounds. But one troy pound contained only 12 troy ounces. So a troy ounce is actually slightly bigger than our standard ounce. So those gold, silver, platinum, those are all traded in troy units yet. So when you hear that $2,000 an ounce, it's actually bigger than what we would think of as an ounce. Not a lot, but slightly. Okay, that is all of our units of standard measurement. Let's talk about conversion. Converting. Now, if I give you four feet and I ask you to convert that in inches, a lot of people could actually just rattle that off. What is it? What is it? 48, yeah. You just know that you're going from feet to inches, you multiply by 12. Well, what's really happening there is you're taking that four feet and you're doing dimensional analysis. You're putting it over one and you are eliminating the feet. So I'm going to multiply it by a conversion factor. I'm going to put feet on bottom here, inches on top. One foot is equal to 12 inches. So the feet cancel out. I have 4 times 12 inches is 48 inches. 1 times 1 is 1. So it's 48 inches over 1 or just 48 inches. What we're doing there, this little thing here is called a unity fraction. We've used that tool before. When we had 3 fourths and we wanted to convert it, we multiplied by 
like five over five. Three times five is 15, four times five is 20. And the three fourths and the 15 twentieths are equivalent because this here is a unity fraction. It's equal to one. The numerator and denominator have the same value. Well, this here does not look like it's equal to one, but it is. 12 inches and one foot have exactly the same value. So when I multiply by it, I can change the appearance, but not the value. Just like here, we change the appearance, but not the value. Well, with feet and inches, we're familiar with those units, so it's maybe not quite as necessary. But let's look at something we're not as familiar with. Let's say we have 99 feet, and I want to convert it into rods. That's not one that we know how to do just off the top of our head. So I take the 99 feet, turn it over 1. In my conversion factor here, I want to get rid of feet. I'll put feet on bottom. I'm going to rods. My equivalency, I know that one rod is 16.5 feet. The feet cancel out. 99 times one rod is 99 rods. One times 16.5 is 16.5. I divide that out. 99 rods divided by 16.5 is six rods. Now, in your textbook and in my math lab, they tend to want to do conversions in a certain way, um, especially when they're doing standard to metric. Now, they might tell you that one inch equals 2.54 centimeters, and we'll talk about those metric units in just a minute. And you want to convert, oh, eight inches into centimeters. Well, they'll use that you know, eight inches over one. We're gonna put inches on bottom, centimeters on top. One inch is 2.54. The inches cancel out. You multiply that out. Eight times 2.54 is 20.32 centimeters over one. So it's just 20.32 centimeters. If, however, we were going the other direction and we wanted to know Well, 20 centimeters is how many inches? We would not use that equivalency of one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. What we would do is we would take one inch equals 0.3937. Sorry, one centimeter equals 0.3937 inches. 20 centimeters over one. We're gonna put centimeters on bottom, inches on top. Centimeters have to go on bottom so that they'll cancel out. One centimeter equals 0.3937 inches. So then we multiply that out, that is 7.874 inches. The reason they do it that way is then you always have one on the bottom, so you don't end up having to divide out here. So in my math lab, try to do the conversion so it's always one on the bottom. If you happen to use the one inch is 2.54, you would put one inch here, 2.54 centimeters on bottom. It's going to come out really close to the same thing. Centimeters cancel out. You've got 20 inches over 2.54. Well, 20 divided by 2.54 is 7.874 with some other little decimals after it. So it comes out to be the same thing most of the time, but it can be off by a hundredth or a thousandth of a unit um, in some cases. So if you do this in my math lab and it marks it wrong and your answer is really, really close to the answer they give, Chances are you just used a different equivalency. They were using the one that had one in the denominator just to make it easier. Use whichever one you're comfortable with, and if my math lab marks it wrong, let me know, and I'll go back and I'll double check them, and I'll, I'll change the grades for you. So we've got just a couple of minutes to talk about metric measurement. The metric planned system. That standard system evolved over time out of a need. 
like we said, the units didn't even work together at first. We had to adjust them so that they would work together and we can convert between them. It evolved over literally thousands of years. Well, the metric system, because we'd used the standard system for thousands of years, we knew the weaknesses, we knew the things that worked well and the things that didn't work well. So they designed a system that, that worked better, basically. It was designed in the late 1800s, about 1890, it was about when it was designed. And it was designed to have only one unit for each type of measurement. So for length, that unit was the meter, abbreviated with just an M. For weight, that unit was a Newton, abbreviated with a capital N. And most of you probably never heard of a Newton for measurement, or you have very briefly. Um, in the metric system, we tend to focus on mass rather than weight. So for mass, we use the gram, abbreviated with the little g. For volume, of course, it's square meters or whatever square units. Capacity, we use a liter, abbreviated with an L. Now, I was always taught it had to be a capital L. I found out later that it wasn't really defined in the metric system. The reason I was always told it had to be a capital L is because if you use a small L, is that an L or is that a one? Or a capital I, yes. So it's really tough to tell the difference. You know, something like that, is that a 51 or is that five liters? If we use a capital L, it's pretty clearly five liters. Um, so it's not required to use a capital L, it's just the capital L makes it easier to distinguish. So then if we wanna measure things smaller or larger than those main units, We want to go smaller, we use the prefix deci, which means one tenth. So a decimeter is a tenth of a meter. Decigram is a tenth of a gram. Deciliter is a tenth of a liter. Centi is one one hundredth. So centimeter is a hundredth of a meter. Centigram is a hundredth of a gram, and so on. And milli is one one thousandth. So millimeter is mm. Milligram, mg, ml for milliliter is a thousandth of that main unit. After that, we didn't go by tens anymore. We didn't, we skipped the 10,000 and 100,000 and we went to a millionth. Millionth is micro. Now, m was already used for millimeters, so they used the Greek letter mu. Mu looks kind of like a u with a long tail. Like that, that is the Greek letter mu. So mu m, mu g, mu l is microgram, micrometer, microliter. Going the other way, we had deca. D-E-K-A or D-E-C-A. Um, again, D was already used for deci. So deca was 10 meters or 10 grams or whatever. They used D-A for deca. Hecto meant 100. So HM was a hectometer, that's 100 meters. Kilo was 1,000. So KM was 1,000 meters. And then again, we skipped 10,000, 100,000, and we went to mega, which was a million. They used capital M for mega. So a megagram was a million grams. Now, they designed all these in practice. What ends up being used is the main unit, milli, and kilo for most of them. In the United States, we use centimeters a lot. Just because centimeters is the closest thing to the inch, and the inch is so ingrained in us. If you go to other countries, the millimeter is used way more than the centimeter. The other ones do have special applications. So your conversions are just a matter of moving. Every step here is multiplying or dividing by 10. So it's a matter of moving a decimal point. We'll look at that more tomorrow. For right now, there is a new homework out there. That new homework was technically due today because it's the one from Monday. Um, I will, it'll give you a notice that it's past due. Just keep working on it. And we'll exempt that. There is going to be a new quiz, though, that will be tomorrow after class. So midnight tomorrow. Just be aware. That quiz will be, we're going to try to hold to that quiz schedule. Tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about the metric system and comparing between standard and metric. And then we'll move on. You guys have a good day.